Let's all stand and uh, worship with me as we sing. Uh, here I am to worship. That's awesome right there. Thank you, Brooklyn. And thank you, Philip. Thank you, Waylon, for playing the drums. <laughs> I thought about that and I'm like, well, I don't know what will be the bigger distraction, Waylon beating the drums behind her or uh, me going up and getting Waylon. I said, well, he's already there. So let's just let him let him beat on him. Yeah. You know, I just got done saying you, you're not too young to young to uh, worship. He says, Well, I'll show you, Daddy. We'll get up we'll get up there, but man, that is uh that is awesome. And any of you just like Waylon, if you feel like getting up there and worshiping, go right on ahead and get up there and worship. 
But uh, if you got your Bibles, uh, let's turn to the book of James, chapter 3. And we're going we're gonna to look at what God's Word has for us. While, while you're finding it, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God. Lord, we thank you today for the, the opportunity to be here, Lord, to, to hear your Word, Lord. Lord, we thank you that your Word has changed in power, God. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. And if there be one here today under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that they'll, they'll quickly make the decision to follow and worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So y'all got James chapter 3? All right, y'all stand. Let's honor the reading of the Word of God. My brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which thou they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet have turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how a great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a, word, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell, For every kind of beast and and of bird and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the, the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both the old salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, Lord. Lord, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, this particular scripture is is talking about our tongues, Lord. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that... During this time period, Lord, and every time period that, that I'll take this, this pulpit in the future, Lord. Lord, I, I pray that my tongue be yielded to you, God. My tongue be of service to you, God. And, and Lord, let the real wisdom come from you, God. Let the real teacher, the real preacher come, God. Let the Holy Spirit fill this place, God. Lord, just use me as the, as the vessel, as the mouthpiece that you'd have up here, Lord. And if it be your will not to have me as the mouthpiece, God, then you take me out of here, God, and let, and let somebody a willing vessel be your mouthpiece, God. Let it, let it be so in all the churches of our nation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> the first point that I want to make to you today is, is something I, I've, got to, I've got to call myself down from time to time. And one, the first point I want to make is I want to thank God today, right here in front of everybody, for not giving me the desires of my heart. I want to thank God for that today. Instead of giving me the desires of my heart, God thought better to change my heart. And I I praise God for that. And I hope that you sitting here today under the sound of my voice can praise God for the same thing. James chapter 3, verse 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. 
This word masters, it means a couple of things. It, it is definitely talking about masters of assemblies. It is definitely talking about men that would fill the pulpit. It is definitely talking about learned scholars of the Word of God. It, it, is, it is talking about a bunch of different things there. And we, we need to pay attention here. Be, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. I, I want to say this first and foremost, that the man of God, whether he be in the pulpit or whether he be in the seminary, he will be held to a greater and higher standard because that man is supposedly has the truth and what he does with it, he'll be judged by. And you here today, hearing the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, what you do with the Word of God, you will be held accountable for that. At the moment of my salvation, when I, when I say I thank God for not giving me the desires of my heart, at the moment of my salvation, I knew that I was being called to preach. I absolutely knew it. And I ran from that call. I ran from it because I wanted to have control over the type of ministry that I was involved in. And you may say, well, well Robert, you didn't run from the call. You went to seminary. I went to, yes, I went to seminary. I think that was my phone. It might, that better have been Jesus calling me. No, he come through on mine too, I believe. Maybe somebody in here is texting the whole group. But when you, you may think, well, you went straight to seminary, so you did, you did answer that call immediately, but that wasn't the case. When, when I went to seminary, I knew from time to time I'd fill the pulpit from places, but it never was my intention to do that. It never was my intention to, to uh, pastor a church. I thought, well, that might be a temporary solution, a means to an end to get me to, to what, what I actually wanted to do. But I knew I was called to preach. But I had this other idea. I had, a, I had an idea that I thought was better than the, God idea, the, better than the idea that God had for me. Better than, than, than the great planner. I thought my plans were the, were the most important. My desire after salvation... Before salvation, I wanted to be a constitutional lawyer. After salvation, I wanted to go teach the Word of God in a seminary. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to go up to one of the, the big boy seminaries and have one of those classes sit there, teach the, the same subject from now until retirement, write books on that subject, and just, just be able to give out to those students every little thing that I had uncovered from the Word of God. But that wasn't the plan that God had. It, was, it definitely wasn't the call that God had. It was the call that Robert wanted to have from God. And I, I even went so far to give God a list of things that I would not do. On top of that list was youth ministry. Very tip top. I'll never in a million years do youth ministry. Why not? Because I get mad at my kids. I, 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 fuss, I fuss at them. I spank my kids often, and I still feel like they don't get spanked enough. So when, when I'm around a whole bunch of kids, I'm going to tell you what, when my kids are in the room, I guarantee they're the most spanked children in that room. If you're, if you're spanking your kids more than I am, you probably need to seek professional help about that. Because, I mean, I, I've gotten to the point now where they don't even, I can, I can look at them now, and they know, hey, Daddy is a creative spanker, and he'll, he'll, be, he'll be creative with how he punishes me. Now, I'm getting more and more creative where, where I, I found different things work better than, 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 a, than, a, than a physical spanking from time to time. I, I, poor, poor old Cash, man. I, I had him the other day. I, he he back-talked me. I said, well, I got something for you, buddy. You're going to walk up and down these stairs over and over again until I get tired. <laughs> And he did. And he walked and walked and walked and walked. And he found out walking those stairs hurts more than a spanking. And he would rather just listen to what Daddy says from now on. But I have this, this particular, particular call from God. And I knew youth ministry wasn't it. So what happens? I'm in the, I'm in the pulpit and I want to run from the pulpit so bad. I took a position, which I'm thankful I took because God was working this plan out for me. Took a position down in Florida, dealing with kids, teaching, teaching Bible in a, in a high school atmosphere. I fell in love with working with kids, but really what I was in love with was presenting the gospel 
over and over and over and over again to, to vessels that were craving that attention. Well, that's what I was truly in, in love with there. And then when, when that season ended and I decided, hey, you know, let's go back and be, be back in North or South Carolina. You know, I looked around for different things and then this, little, this youth pastor position come open. And it had really opened me up to the idea of working with youth. I'm like, hey, you've been doing this for the past year. Let's go work with youth. And so we, we came here and, and we enjoyed it. And <laughs> went long after and wound up in the, in the pulpit. So as I was running from the pulpit, God says, I'm going to make a way. You're going to get in that pulpit. Uh, and I, I didn't realize the hard road that it would take to get there. But I, I ran from it and I sought after my desires but God knew better, and He had planned better than I had. He knew that I would plan to, do, to run from it. And just like, just like uh, throwing Jonah in the belly of the whale, He threw me through some trials. Where did I wind up at? Right in the pulpit that I was running from. But that was my desire to go, go teach at a seminary. I wanted to do that. I, I, I managed to go through the, the steps that would be required to do that, to get all the prerequisites. But this was a plan of vanity. This wasn't to glorify God, this was to glorify myself. When I tell you I thank God for not opening those particular doors, I mean I'm truly grateful for it. At this moment in our history, in the time we live in, the same seminaries that I wanted to go sit and teach at are nothing but cesspools of filth, and instead of teaching Bible doctrine, they're indoctrinating men and even women to incorrectly handle Scripture and become Bible correctors instead of Bible professors. And that's a funny name for them, isn't it? Now that I sit there and think about it. You know, a professor at a at a Bible college, they're not really professing a whole lot of Bible, they're professing a whole lot of opinion and a whole lot of Bible correcting. But right now, at this very moment, if, if you'll go, uh, you can look it up on the internet, there are at least 91, 91, not different seminaries, different denominations of seminaries. 91 different ones. If you go to the the ATS website, which is the big, uh, the big accrediting uh, body that accreditates seminaries uh, in America, there are 91 active denominational seminaries, and each of those denominations has several different seminaries under their, under their little section that they're in, under their little denomination. And every one of those 91 teach something different. So what is the point of accreditation with a Bible degree if there are 91 different flavors of stupid out there that you could possibly teach instead of teaching the Word of God? I thank God for not allowing me to become a Bible corrector. I thank God for calling me to preach. And there's a difference between a teacher and a preacher, and I thank God I escaped the, the teacher part. It's fair to say that you could teach from the pulpit, but a preacher is something else. A preacher, I don't have to try to, to sway you into the believe in what I believe. A preacher is a herald, and that means that's someone who, who shouts loudly. That's someone who proclaims the Word of God. It's not some kind of doctrine I want you to, uh, to believe. It's the Word of God I want to point you to. If you don't hear anything I have to say, is you don't have to pay me any attention, but pay attention to what God has said. I have nothing of any more importance to tell you than God's Word is perfect and it doesn't matter what man stands behind the pulpit unless it were Jesus Christ Himself. That man is fallible and He is not perfect. Only Christ is perfect. Regardless of the man, you don't have to get your doctrine from a seminary. You don't have to get your doctrine from a preacher. You can get your doctrine from the Bible itself. Praise God we have that ability. Praise God we live in a time with ease of access within the language that we speak. We have unlimited access to the perfect, pure, infallible, inspired Word of God. 
these, uh, these seminaries, they want you to sit under their Bible corrector. They want you to sit under that Bible corrector who has a small God. And they want, you to te- they want you to listen to the teachings that that man has for you. They want you to, to buy into his small God theory. And they want you to, to buy into the books that that man would sell. And they want you to, to buy into the, the books of the people that would come through that seminary. I, I saw something just, just today. It just made me absolutely sick. A young man was looking for, a, um, for some uh, recommendations on a on a particular uh, seminary and what he was looking at, I'm, I'm thinking, man, like, how, how dumb do you have to be to ask for the recommendation that you're asking for? It had to line up specifically with this doctrine that he was looking for. Well, if you already know the doctrine that you want, what, what's the point in even going? You already know what you want to believe. You just want somebody to confirm what you already believe. That, that's, that's crazy talk right there. If I want to learn something, I want to learn something that I didn't know before. That's why I love when I find out I've been wrong about something in Scripture because I have an opportunity to learn something versus taking something that I've already thought and having somebody back me up on it. I, 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 I love being able to, to actually learn. And I'm going to tell you what, if you go seek out men that already think like you do to learn from that man, I can promise you, you're not going to learn anything. You'll have what you already know backed up, and that does, that does nothing for you. But if you'll go to the Word of God, you'll see so many things that have been covered and hidden from you by denominational teaching that it is just flat out sickening. And you'll, you'll have things revealed to you that, that you'll never have revealed to you in seminary. I can, I can promise you this. From somebody that's gone from, from step one all the way to the final step in seminary, I can promise you this, that I learned more in sermon prep and Bible study than I've ever learned under any seminary professor ever. Anyone. So I, I say that because you, you cannot sling a dead cat without hitting somebody that's got a stack of degrees on the wall. You, can't, you cannot do that. And I'm, I'm glad I've got them because you know what that stack of deg- degrees did? That stack of degrees gets you a foot in the door in some places. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you what, you go right now to the, the websites where pastors look for jobs at. Hey, if you ain't got that stack of degrees, guess what? You're not getting in the door there. That church don't want you because they have a predetermined message that they want to hear from a predetermined group of men who have learned from a predetermined group of men and care nothing about what the Word of God says. Absolutely nothing. And that's the state of the church. In the Sunday school class this morning, it was said that the the bride of Christ is filthy. Well, let me tell you, that's why it's filthy right there. Because the bride of Christ has has a predetermined idea of what they want Scripture to say instead of seeking out what it actually says. And it, it would behoove us. You want to see real revival in America? You seek out the Scripture and not your own personal preference. You seek out the Word of God and the Word of God will change you. And if you and the Word of God aren't meshing, it's you that's wrong. It's not ever the Word that's wrong. You need to look at that Word like it's a mirror and you wouldn't, you wouldn't if, if you were to walk out of the house in the morning and you had a uh, uh, we, things we talked about, we talked about bumps and stuff in there too, but you wouldn't walk out the house with a great big old nasty honker of a zit on your nose right here without mashing it. Well, some of you walk around, myself included, walk around with great big old honkers of spiritual zits on us that we're not doing anything about, where, but if we'll look at the Word of God, let the Word of God be our mirror, we can, we can clean ourselves up a little bit based off of the Word based off of the mirror. But I thank God for saving me from that. I thank God that we don't have to depend on scholarly work or professors or preachers, that we can depend on God's Word. These seminaries, they want to control and persuade what's preached in the pulpits instead of allowing the Word of God to have its way, instead of allowing the Spirit of God to have room to move freely. I thank God for saving me from that. But I hope those teachers pay close attention to to this passage of Scripture at who has the greater condemnation, because it is the teacher. 
It is the preacher. And it's my intention to stand before God one day and hear the words of Matthew 25, 21, where the Word of God reads this way, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And one of the few things that I have full intention of being faithful over between now and when God calls me home is I plan on being faithful to rightly divide the Word of truth. And I have no doubt whatsoever on that day that many Bible correctors that have plagued this world, they'll hear something a little different. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 27. Beware of false prophets which come to you in, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. This is a conversation that Brittany and I have often. How can, how can these people that seem so good be so evil? Hey, she'll say, well, how, she says, how do you feel comfortable actually saying that from the pulpit? And I tell her, because it is what it is. Because the Bible said it would be this way. They, they, they come in sheep's clothing. They come, they come in the name of, of teaching you the Bible. They come in the, they come in the name of, of helping you grow into a scholarly Christian instead of a devoted Christian. They, they, come, they, come into these, they come to you and it looks innocent. But it's not innocent. They're ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns of, or figs of thistles? Here's a fruit to know them by. Do they think they know better than the Word of God knows? Do they, do, do they correct a perfect, infallible God? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. With how they handle the Word of God, changing it, correcting it, so-called correcting it. Is that good fruit? Is that, is that if, it's, if it's not good fruit, if it is bad fruit... What does the Word say will happen with the tree that harvests bad fruit? It'll be hewn down. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let's go a little further here. This will, this will be the context of what's said there. But I promise you, there will be men there that day, and women, that have said, have we not preached the gospel? Have we not, have we not stood in the pulpit? Have we not wore the, the robes? Have we, now they even wear the little prayer robes with the rainbow flag on them because they want, to, they want to teach the homosexuality in the church. Now they want to teach that it's okay. Isn't it just, just sick to know that they'll stand up there and profess something that which God says is a sin, profess it to be love? Or they will love you straight to hell is what they'll do. God will profess that He never knew them. And they'll say, well, we did all this good stuff for you, God. We, 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 spent, we dedicated our whole life to correcting all the mistakes you made in your Word. Well, praise God. I believe you're going to hell for that. I believe God's Word is clear on that. It's sickening. You'll know them by the fruit. And the rain descended. Oh, bear with me, I missed one. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. 
And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want to tell you all today, if you don't hear anything, I want you to hear this. I'm here to tell you to let your faith be founded at the foundation of God's Word. That is the strongest foundation that you can have. I thank God today that right under my feet, under this stage, there's a King James Bible under my feet right now, and that's the foundation of this church. I thank God for that today. Let God's Word be your foundation. Not the, not the teachings of some seminary, not, the, not denominational teaching, but God's Word. Be rooted in that. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to proclaim it till the day I die that the King James is the Word of God, and the rest of them are dirty old filthy perversions, are no good for nothing, not even propping open a door with. I'll proclaim it until I die. If they, if they don't like it, they don't have to like it, but I will proclaim it because it is the strong foundation. And you can take all the, the other ones that the Bible correctors have put together and it'd be just like sand. When the rain comes, that foundation will crumble. And you, it doesn't even have to rain hard to let the foundation crumble on those perversions. You can, you can go just about any, any chapter, almost any verse, and crumble the, the so-called foundation of those perverted texts. Something as small as a single word can have incredible power. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. For in, in, in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter, a little fire kindled, and the tongue is a fire, a, a world of iniquity, uh, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among a, of our members, that it defiled the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. I want to say this right now, uh, this wasn't in my notes, it wasn't, planned, it wasn't planned to be said, but it's been something I've been experiencing lately, many of you know about it. I broke a tooth off not long ago. And it started touching my tongue. That tongue swole up in my mouth. And it was hurting. It was hard to even talk. I wanted nothing better than to stay home, not say a word, keep my mouth shut. That tongue was literally going to control my entire body. That little piece of flesh right there was going to control it all. And I wanted just to say that before I get into this. Because the truth is a man's tongue has the ability to lead many people into some pretty rough temptations. My, my little tongue was about to lead me, I thought, into a, a hospital bed because it hurt so bad. Praise God, it's, it's quit hurting. It might, it might hurt to, today, but it ain't hurting right now. With just his voice, his tongue, Adolf Hitler gave a command that would kill millions of people with his tongue. Pharaoh... King Herod, with just their tongues, gave commands that would kill untold numbers of people. Men have challenged God's word since the beginning of time, and their words have gotten them into trouble. They said the Titanic was unsinkable. Anybody know where the Titanic's at right now? It's at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic Ocean to be specific. Unsinkable, huh? Just recently, anybody ever heard of Kathy Griffin, the not-so-funny comic, who just recently stood on stage? I'm, I'm, she held up a trophy or an award that she had won. And... I hope this word doesn't, doesn't offend anyone of you in here. It's a quote. 
she said, Suck it, Jesus. This is my God now. And she said that. Wow. That's the same woman that held up the uh, bloody head of, of Donald Trump. You know, that's the same woman that had just tweeted uh, when he came out and said he had the coronavirus, that, that tweeted, is he dead yet? Let me know when it's over. She stood on stage and she said, suck it, Jesus. This is my God now. Talking about that little idol in her hand. Hmm. You know what Kathy Griffin's up to right now? Cancer. It's killing her. Titanic's unsinkable. Kathy Griffin's got her own little guide now. Wonder, I wonder if she prays that thing to heal her. I pray that she'll turn to Jesus Christ before it's too late. I pray that. If she's not too evil to save, I promise you that. If she's too evil to save, then I was too evil to save. Let's go a little further here. Some of y'all might be old enough to remember John Lennon. Y'all remember John Lennon? Anybody in here? Younger ones. I, I see. I've got one who remembers John Lennon. You remember John Lennon from the Beatles? John Lennon. Y'all know what John Lennon did right before he died? He said on national television that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus Christ. A few weeks later, he drew his last breath. Y'all probably haven't heard of... Uh, uh, Tancredo Neves, La Roca has heard of him because uh, he ran for president of Mexico. While running for president of Mexico, he made the statement that if he could get a half a million votes, not even God himself could keep him from being president of Mexico. He got a half a million votes. He won by a landslide. Got sick and died before Inauguration Day. Hmm. All right, so some of y'all didn't know who John Lennon was. So if we'll go a little bit younger with this one. Anybody know who Bon Scott was? He was famous for writing and singing an ACDC song. He, he, was, he was one of, one of their singers. Most famous for singing the song Highway to Hell. Y'all know what happened to Bon Scott? He choked on his own vomit. He died a few months after writing these lyrics. Hey, Satan, paying my dues, playing in a rocking band. Hey, Mama, look at me. I'm on the way to the promised land. I'm on the highway to hell. Highway to hell. I'm on the highway to hell. Highway to hell. Don't stop me. They didn't. And he died of asphyxiation. Y'all familiar with Marilyn Monroe? Billy Graham went to go share the gospel with her. She chased him out of the room, throwing stuff at him. Take your Jesus. I don't need it. Died two weeks later. Hmm. If God won't give you what you want, <laughs> what you ask for, man, I, I don't even know what to think about these things. I mean, these are, these are people clearly mocking God and it being, being handled swiftly. I pray that these people come to a saving grace of Jesus Christ before their death. I pray, I pray they do, but I tell you what they did bef before they got to this point is they led a lot of people astray. If man's words are so important that God would even strike him down over them, then the Word of God must be infinitely more important. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Romans 10 and 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. God's Word is infinitely important, obviously. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Romans 1 and 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If our words are important, God's words must be infinitely more important. But not only is there power in the words of God, but there's, there's one word in particular there's some extreme power in. 
And it's a name. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. When God says it, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. When you say it, Philippians two and ten, uh, two, Philippians chapter two, verses ten through twelve says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in, in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have also obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear. And trembling. Man, there is power in the name of Jesus. And the Bible correctors want to take the God who's got infinite power in His words, they want to take that God of the Bible off the throne. They don't have access to God in their lost condition. And because they don't have access to Him, they attack His word. Even subtle changes are attempt to make God out to be a liar. They don't want you to believe what God says. They want you to believe what they have to say about what God says. They don't have their tongues under control. And it affects everything they do. It affects the students they teach. It affects the books they write. And it affects the churches that those students go on to serve. The tongue is powerful. But, most, but it's most powerful when that tongue's been submitted to God. Why do you think that one of the first things a Christian is required to do is to confess Jesus Christ? Romans 10, verses 9 through 10 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Look at how much power is in your tongue. Look at how much power is in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at how much power is in confessing Jesus Christ. What, is it, what does it say? My Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. There's power in words. There's particularly power in the Word of God. There's particularly power in the Son of God. You call His name. You be like that thief on the cross says, Remember me, Jesus when you come into your kingdom. You call on the name of the Messiah. You call on the, the name of the man that hung between heaven and earth. You call on His name, and there is power in His name. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There are power in words. There's a rebellious tongue as well. James chapter 3, verses 7 through 8 it says, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of, uh, and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. In the animal kingdom, there is a definite gap between human beings and animals. Definite gap. It's rare for an animal, even what's considered an apex predator out there. Um, th these are the bad boys, lions, tigers, bears, crocodiles, um, polar bears, uh, hard to name bears, but there's different kinds of bears. Apex predators. I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I think the mosquito might be the most apex of all, all predators. It kills more people than any animal ever. Only animal that kills more people than the mosquitoes are, might, be, might be people themselves. But animals don't just attack humans. Not for fun, anyway. The only time you'll see uh, animals attacking a human, the, it'll be under certain conditions. One of those uh, conditions will be if the animal was rabid. That's a, that's a good chance. They, they say if you ever get bit by a raccoon or, or a fox or something, probably it's rabid. If it got you during the, during the daytime and nighttime, you might have startled it. But some animals only attack when they're scared. Now, I've heard people, and this includes snakes, but you know, uh, rattlesnakes, they come with a little warning bell. God thought enough of us to, to put a little shaker on, the, on that rattlesnake so we didn't get bit by it. Now, people, people say, well, preacher, well, a water moccasin, it'll, it'll chase you down and bite you. And it will. A water moccasin will chase you down and bite you if you get in his way. If you get out of that water moccasin's way, he'll let you go unless he thinks you're just something to eat. Unless he mistakes your hand or your foot 
for a fish, that water moccasin will probably let you go. I, I saw an incredible thing the other day on, on television where the guy had a water moccasin chasing him. He's like, y'all got to stop being scared of these things. Just get out of his way, and he'll go on. And he, and he showed over and over again these water moccasins would just pass him right on by. They didn't want nothing to do with him. They, he just happened to be in their way. But now, what, what do we do when we see one of them? We freeze up and we stay in their way. Get out of his way. Let him go. You hear that little shaker on that, on that rattlesnake going? Hey, you better stand still for a second. <laughs> and then look now. You don't want to step towards that joker because you step towards him. You're going to scare him a little bit. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to bite you. You're walking through the woods. If you're walking through by pairs, you know who the most likely person to get bit by a snake is? The second man. The first one scared him. The second one got bit because the first one scared him. That's, that's why snakes bite. Some animals will only attack when they're hungry. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Well, she might watch it later, but Brittany, Brittany, well, Cindy gets hangry, and, you know, women are, women are good about attacking when they're hungry. But some, sometimes animals just do that. They attack because they're hungry. These things, they do happen, but they're extremely, extremely rare. In fact, more people are killed every year by getting trampled by cows than they are eaten by lions, tigers, bears, sharks, alligators, and crocodiles combined. Trampled by cows. My high school librarian, she got kicked by a cow not long ago and they thought it was going to kill her. I'm like, well, great day. That's not something you expect to hear via Facebook that somebody got trampled by a cow. But, hey, it happens. I've never known anybody to get eat by a lion. Not me personally know them, but trampled by cows. Oh, I've known plenty of people to get stomped. I even got attacked by a pig one time. But this happens when they're scared or hungry. Animals have a rational fear of humans, but no human that I know of lays in bed at night and thinks, you know what, I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom, get me a drink of water. I hope a lion doesn't jump on me and pounce me in my kitchen or in my bathroom. No, no human fears that, but guess what? Animals rationally fear whether or not they're going to get shot when they go out. They rationally have a fear of humans. And they stay away from us because of that. They do their best to stay away from us. You won't find grizzly bears uh, roaming around New York City looking for a snack. Animals try to stay away from humans. But human beings will go so far as to put an animal in a cage and they'll train that animal until it's tame, until it can eat out of your hand. We can domesticate an animal with ease, but we cannot seem to tame our own tongues. There are people out there who strut around like peacocks, just proud of the fact that they'll say whatever they want to say to whoever they want to say to. It doesn't matter if they offend them. It doesn't matter if they offend me or you. You know why it doesn't matter? Because that person's better than we are and they'll tell you if you just ask. They're egotistical. They're narcissistical people who are unwilling to change. They say, well, this is the way God made me, and I'm just going to offend everybody I can, and, and not, nothing's going to stop me. They say things like, I'm not mean, I'm just opinionated. That's not being opinionated. That's being a jerk with an unruly tongue, with an untamed tongue. Verse 9 goes on, Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. This is not the likeness of God, by the way. This is not God's image. Because once Adam fell, we were no longer in his image. We were in the image of Adam at that point. This is the similitude of God. This is, this is, we're similar, not in his image though. But out of the same mouth proceeding blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not be so. So in one moment, they're, they're blessing God, praising God. Y'all know the people I'm talking about. Everybody's got family like this, especially family. Great day. But everybody knows who I'm talking about here. You, you've got people that'll, that'll bless God, praise God around the right people. 
and then curse God's creation around the right people. I'm, tell you what, if you've got people that are cursing God's creation, cursing other people around you, you might want to find out why they're comfortable doing that around you, first off. You might want to get that nipped in the butt pretty quickly. But out of the same mouth proceeding blessings and cursings, you know, think about it. We curse God, but then, well, we bless God, well, they might as well be cursing God. They bless God and then curse His creation. Doth the fountain sent forth at the same place sweet, water, and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine fig? Vine fig, so can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh? It is double minded of us to praise God and curse His creation. It is double minded. It, if I told you that about Kathy Griffin earlier without, without telling you that I would like for Kathy Griffin to be saved, that would be double-minded of me. I want Kathy Griffin to experience Jesus Christ just as much as I want Azariah to experience Jesus Christ, just as much as I want my children to experience Jesus Christ. And anything less than that would be hypocritical and double-minded and I won't be fit to stand in the pulpit. The man of God ought, ought to strive to be a, a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper, a peacemaker. There's a, there's a difference there. You know, they thought so much of that word peacemaker, they even named a gun after it. Verse 13 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his work with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and, e and every evil work. But in the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercies and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The wisdom of man is full of lies and it's devilish. There cannot be peace without purity. Those men in those seminaries, they can't possibly teach peace if their word's not pure, if they have to correct it. They cannot possibly be teaching God's word because God's word is first pure. There cannot be purity without righteousness. Science and psychology and seminary does not offer peace, they offer compromise. Attempts to correct the Word of God do not offer peace. They offer lies. Claiming that God's Word is perfect, or that, excuse me, claiming that God is perfect, but His Word is not, is heretical. Claiming that God, in, that God inspired His inspired Word, right here, claiming that God's inspired Word was written by men instead of giving the credit of authorship to the Holy Spirit, is blasphemy. Man couldn't have done this work. The Holy Spirit had to do that work. Over 40 authors, almost 1,600 years, and it fits together perfectly. Authors that never met each other. Authors that at one time would have killed each other. And the Word of God fits together perfectly. In conclusion, I'm going to say this. Men may have an unruly tongue, but God says what He means, and He means what He says. <clears throat> Psalms 12, verses 6 through 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. Here it is right here from this generation forever. Psalms 119 and 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. But we're going to correct it on earth, right? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 through 25, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I'm ready for you, Franz. God said a few things. One thing He said is that we're all sinners. 
Remember, God's Word has power. It's more powerful than the words of man. God said that we're all sinners. God said that He sent Jesus Christ to save sinners, not good people. God said if we would repent of our sins and turn to Jesus, He would save us from the penalty of our sin. Would you let Him do that today? Would you let Him save you from the penalty of your sin? Would you would repent from your sins and would you turn to Jesus Christ? Would you trust Him with your eternal soul and surrender your mind and body to Him today? Would you go even further? Would you surrender your tongue to Him today? And let Him speak through you? Would you use the most powerful part of your body, the tongue, to glorify King Jesus? If y'all would stand to your feet. And every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody, nobody's looking around. If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you lift your hand and let me pray for you? If you're in here today and you know you've submitted your mind and your heart to Jesus, but you'd like to submit your tongue, would you lift your head and let me pray for you today? Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for that hand. That's awesome. Hey, just do it. The one thing Nike got right, just do it. You want, you want to do it? Submit. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be, it's going to be difficult. People are going to hate you. People are going to talk about you. People are going to run you down. But they're just getting to you because they can't get to God. And you don't have nothing to worry about. Because our God is our protector. When the man of God or woman of God is in the will of God, doing what God would have them do, that person has absolutely... That, that, that person is absolutely uh, immortal as long as they're in God's will. That don't mean you can't, won't go out there and get hurt. That means as long as you're a willing vessel, God will continue to use you. He will continue. And He'll protect you divinely. He'll let you suffer the things you need to suffer, but He will protect you divinely. He will sharpen you and He'll send the right people at the right time to you and He'll send you at the right time to the right people. If you'll submit mind, body, and tongue to Jesus Christ. These altars are open for those of you that have business to do with, with our Lord and Savior. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God. Lord, we thank You today for the reading and the hearing of Your Word. Lord, we thank You for those that raise their hand, Lord, and profess that they want to submit their tongue to You, God. They're so far, God, their hands have been faithful and the hands raised, Lord. But I pray as they go forth from this place, Lord, I pray that what they were professing with their body will be confirmed with their tongue, God. Lord, we thank You so much, Lord, for the salvation that we're given. Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word, Lord. We thank You so much for all that You do for us. But Lord, we mostly thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.